But having them in the club, of course, means that, you know, obviously anybody can be involved. Um, the, the senior decision maker might be on a business trip to China, but they can still look into their telephone, get the relevant information and click and say, yes, go ahead and do such and stuff. So the, this is the, the clever bit, if you like, is that the workflows, instead of being on Excel sheets or on um, Visio or something like that, they're, they're actually accessible um, th through the internet. And that gives a huge freedom um, and a huge range of application, uh, whereas otherwise they would be relatively limited. Process versus workflow, we could haggle over that. Process is probably a bit, little bit more specifically defined. Workflow is something that you do repetitively. Process is more, you do this and you get that, but they're very closely related. So this is the last section. And um, what I wanted to do was talk about procurement cloud workflow priorities. And I've got four or five suggestions here with which you may or may not agree. And I'm going to run through them quickly, and then I'm going to stop um, so that we have an opportunity to interact either by, by, by sound or by chat. So consistent implementation. Um, if you use cloud workflow, then, well, if you use workflow, you can ensure consistent implementation. And you can also improve uh, on a consistent basis, systematic basis for improving. So you can make minor adjustments to your workflow and it applies immediately. Another thing these systems do is they separate out the business rules into a table so that you can look at them from a business viewpoint and say, well, this comes in here, nobody should ever have to wait more than 24 hours for a reply, for example. And those things can be written in and the rules can be managed and then the systems actually access the rules. Whereas in some older systems, the rules were there, but they were embedded in some sort of way that they weren't very easy to see. Um, visibility. With these systems, I didn't point out, but if you have these flow charts, most of these systems will show you where things have got to. So you can look at the chart. The one that we use has a little dot on it, a tiny little green dot. So you can see visually where a process has got to. And that's very good because instead of just being in the dark, you can see, aha, well, step one and two and three happened. And it's in this um, swim lane. And, um, you know, hey, it seems to be stuck. I know, I, at least I need to know who I need to talk to. We can speed up our decision making. Anyone who uses Facebook knows this, that you can get little questions going over and back. If you do it through email, it goes into the queue and then you don't get around answering it and it takes days or weeks or so on. Um, but I, using this sort of chat type style um, it makes it very much um, faster, the decision making, because of quick clarity. And then the last one I have on here is reduced risk. If you have undocumented processes, then you're very dependent on individuals um, and if the situation changes, or uh, they may not be working the best possible way. So I have to say this whole session has taken longer. There's more in it than I, I was uh, reckoning for. But that's the end of, of, of that part. So I think I should here, Jean-Pierre, and leave it over to you for the, for the questions and answers with the few moments we've got. And yes, I, I do have a question, and uh, it's, um, it's a very uh, perennial question. Um, how do you go about measuring the impact of uh, business process modelling? You've just highlighted for us uh, some of the potential advantages, but uh, do you have any recommendations for how companies and indeed procurement organisations can actually uh, quantify the benefits that they get from this, um, this kind of exercise? Uh, two things there. Um, it, it's not worth quantifying uh, to make a decision. I'll give you an example as insurance. You, you could say, how much am I going to save by insuring my car? But people know instinctively. Um, but these processes, these um, tools, they do have statistics built into them. So you can see, for example, um, you know, where, where, product, where process steps are consistently being delayed. So you can make a measurement and say, well, why is this always happening two days after it should have started? And uh, you can go in and then look and talk to the people and adjust the process. So that's probably my recommendation would be uh, to use that, that sort of feature. 
Um, once people understand how these things work, then you can start going into that sort of improvement. Okay, thanks for that. And uh, I have one more question here, which uh, is asking about whether it's possible to uh, dynamically adapt um, the process. So I guess uh, according to changing circumstances, perhaps if there's uh, a situation with particular urgency, is it possible to um, adjust the process uh, that you've designed in order to um, deal with the urgency or, uh, or, or somehow uh, put in a different set of processes depending on the situation? while it's running but what you can do is you can change the process and then you can say please close the existing process and use the data that I've got so far and, and in effect plug me in in the same place um, so it's a bit, a bit like changing you're in a, a bus which is you know has a, a, a mechanical fault and they say please get off and get on the other bus so you can do it that way some systems allow dynamic changes and um, but by definition you can only change things that haven't happened yet. And then um, another way of doing it is you, you live with the fact that it's not perfect if you're doing something fairly regularly. And then when you get to the end of the process, you, you, you make adjustments. So there are different strategies, um, and depending on the sophistication of the, the application. But some of them do allow for dynamic changes. The other ones, you make the change, and, um, but you still get the long-term improvement. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Yashun. Um, I don't have any more questions coming in from uh, from the audience. So unless uh, you or perhaps Bill have anything to add uh, in the few minutes that are remaining, I'd just like to thank you very much indeed for your presentation. Um, I found it absolutely uh, fascinating and uh, very interesting. It's uh, sparked lots of ideas and thoughts uh, for, 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 for myself. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, unless you have anything to add, um, then perhaps we uh, will bring the webinar to a close. Well, I just made the quick comment here that the um, uh, there's a free offer. If somebody would like to help us online uh, modeling uh, a process, uh, then they'd be very welcome to do that. And also, these slides will be available through uh, SlideShare. So uh, if you go there, you can click on the links and, and, and cross-check the various things that are available. And of course, both of um, uh, the companies involved there uh, in, in today's event I'd be very happy if anyone has any queries and those are our contact details. So I suggest we leave them up for a couple of moments. But thanks very much for that and uh, thanks very much for the participation. And um, if there are any suggestions for future webinars, please contact us. Thanks very much.